Välkommen till Stolpe Stories, en podcast om litteratur och humaniora från bokförlaget Stolpe. Vår värld för programmet heter Svante Tiren. Swedish artist and abstract pioneer Hilma Klint was involved in several different spiritual groups and movements during her life. Her belief that there was another world that we cannot see with our bare eyes was shared with many of her contemporaries, and much of her art was in fact made in collaboration with others. In today's episode, Hedvig Martin Alén joins us to explain why and how these groups played such an important role in the life and art of Hilma Klint. Hedvig is also one of the authors of the new book on Anna Kassel and currently doing a PhD on Hilma Klint and her life at the University of Amsterdam. Welcome back to the podcast, Hedvig. Thank you. Now, the turn of the century here, around the year 1900, is a time vibrating with all these societies and groups and movements interested in the spiritual and belief systems outside the church, outside the conventional faith. But how common was it for women to form these groups? It seems there's a lot of women doing this. Yeah, this was very common for mainly upper-class women who are interested in the occult to form different groups or societies where they could meet and discuss this other realm and also try to contact it. So mainly uh, women from a certain class are participating in this. Is this a radical gesture? Is this something that is very provocative or is it widely accepted? I think both, actually. I mean, it depends on who you ask. I think the church would say that it's quite provocative, but at the same time, it was very common at this time. So it's something that is appearing in society in general, both in Sweden and in Europe and in America. So it's sort of a double role here, that Mm. in some sense it is actually widespread and accepted, but of Mm. course there are people also looking at this as a a threat uh, to, to conventional faith. Are most of these sort of secret societies, inward thinking sort of, or are they public? What's the deal here? I would say also both here. I mean, it depends on the society, but of course there is always some sort of core in these societies, perhaps some sense of doing something secret or higher, but at the same time they invite people to join them freely. They are not secret in that sense. And were many of these participants, were they people from, let's say, the creative field, meaning they had interest in in art or, or painting or some kind of craft, or was it a more diverse set of women doing this? I would say that they were probably more diverse. What they had in common was the idea of something higher beyond reality that, you know, we couldn't really sense, but we could perhaps come in contact with if we tried following certain methods or techniques. And... It seems that Hilma Klint joined these movements at a very young age. Is that also typical? Is it something you discover early on in life, typically? Well, Hilma Klint actually did not join them in such an early age because she was around 30 years old, which is opposite to the common myth that she was around 17. But she described when she's around 30 years old that she, for the first time, experienced spiritualism when her friend shows her what is called a psychograph, which is a device for contacting spirits, which is sort of similar to an Uja board, where you have this device that slides over a, a, um, a board of, of letters and point on letters and create messages from the spirit world. So this is the time when she was introduced to spiritualism. And from that time on, she started to be involved in different groups, etc. And I think this is also the normal setting, so to say, that people reached adulthood before they were involved in this. Right, so it's not really for for teenagers and such. It's a no. bit more of a mature occupation. Absolutely. If you were a young woman in Stockholm in the 1890s, let's say, how did you find these group societies? Was it something you could enroll for somewhere or how did you go about? There seems to have been some information in newspaper, for example, about spiritualists coming to visit Stockholm and perhaps were performing in front of an audience. But then I guess there was also a question of contacts, as it often is. You hear about a group, you have a friend of a friend who is uh, active in a group, etc. Now, Hilma Klint was involved in several different groups and movements during her life. She wasn't devoted to only one. Is this also a common feature uh, that you, you change a little bit? 
Very much. I mean, this is the core of the occult and spiritual movement itself, that it mixes different ideas and different beliefs and make it into something new. And then the participants in these movements also did the same. So they mixed spiritualism with theosophy, with anthroposophy, etc., So changing your position or changing your membership in a group, that wasn't necessarily something that compromised your faith. No, not at all. And you were, of course, members in in many groups at the same time. So one did not exclude the other necessarily. And did most of these groups sort of coexist harmoniously or were there rivalry and competition? So theosophy and spiritualism were perhaps the groups with uh, that were most uh, had sort of the, the hardest relationship among each other because theosophy was very critical of spiritualism and the idea of contacting spirits. However, we can see with Av Clint, for example, that she's an example that even if this was the case among the profiles of these movements, people who participated in them did not necessarily see this as a problem. So without any problem, she was both a spiritualist and a theosophist, and she didn't see, you know, any issue with this. Mm. Let's begin with the Edelweiss Society, which is the first group or movement that Hilma Klint joins. What is it? So the Edelweiss Society were a group of upper-class women and also some men who um, met for a very long time. The group was started by Huldine Bimish and Berta Valerius. And um, they were active in contacting spirits and they had, you know, a set of beliefs uh, associated with this, such as they were trying to construct a new faith, a more true form of Christianity, etc., with the help of spirits. And uh, of Clint and all other members of a group that she would later join, the five were members in the Edelweiss Society, and this is where the women met. So this was a very important environment for of Clint and for her friends. Do we know how she found the Edelweiss Society? No, <laughs> this is a very good question. One theory is that another woman named Cornelia Sederberg, who would be part of the five, was the person who introduced of Clinton, her friend, because Sia de Berg had also studied at the technical school where of Clint and Castle studied. However, that was many years before they enrolled there. So they need to be another link here. That is the only connection that we know of prior to the Edelweiss Society. Ilma Clint spends quite a short time with the Edelweiss Society. Mm. Why? We don't know either <laughs> exactly why, but for some reason, they didn't think that the society met up to their spiritual needs or demands. So, of Clint joined in um, 1896, and almost all of the women of the five then exit the society in 1899. And the spirits then says that uh, the society has not been able to provide you with what you need and it's good that you have now left the society. So it doesn't give much information on exactly why. After the Edelweiss Society, Hilma Klint joins the five, which is also the most famous of her her groups and, and gatherings here. When do they start meeting? They formed the five in 1897. So one year after they had met in the Edelweiss Society. And um, it was formed by Sigrid Hedman, who was the leader of the group as well. And then you had of Clint and Anna Kassel and the sisters Cornelia Sederberg and Matilda Nilsson. And what do we know about these women? I mean, not all of them were artists to begin with. Anna Kassel and Hilma Clint were mm. artists, but what were the backgrounds of the others? So Sigrid Hedman, the leader of the group, she was a, what we would call a stay-at-home wife. Uh, she had a lot of children, I think up to eight children, if I remember correctly. And she seems to have devoted her whole life to just, you know, taking care of the children and also being a spiritualist. Another woman that is really interesting is Matilda Nilsson. So she had a uh, spiritual magazine called Efteråt, which means afterwards. And uh, she was a key figure in the occult milieu in Sweden. She also had the library of the Spiritualistic Society in her home. So she was really, you know, a, a her, her home and her as a person was key to the milieu in Stockholm. And then she had a sister, Cornelia Sederberg, and she was a seamstress. 
and she had studied at the technical school. Mm. And were they about the same age, all of these women? Well, not really. So Sigrid Hedman and Matilda Nilsson were in their 50s, Cornelia Sederberg in her 40s, and of Clint and Anna Kassel in their 30s when they all formed the five. So they have met within the Edelweiss society. They certainly share this message that they need to form something. Are there any other ingredient that makes specifically these five choose each other for this group? No, not that we know of. But clearly the group was very convinced that they had been in some way chosen by higher spirits to receive higher mystical messages. So in some way, these women had found each other within the Edelweiss Society, started meeting and developing this idea of being chosen to form a new group. So they start meeting in 1897. Mm. What does a session look like? What do they do when they Mm. meet? So the five, they were a Christian spiritualistic group. And this was the common uh, thing in Sweden that you mixed the Christian beliefs with the new occult elements in society. So they started their seances with a prayer in front of an altar, and the altar had a cross on it. And then they read a a, uh, piece from the New Testament, and then they started contacting spirits. And this was done mainly through Sigrid Hedman and Matilda Nilsson. And Sigrid Hedman was uh, the group's most important medium and she was a very classical medium so she lay down on a couch and she fell asleep as she says she entered a trance state and there she experienced that spirits possess her and start talking through her and other women then write down these messages. Matilda Nilsson used a psychograph, which is a device for contacting spirits. Equivalent to what we call a, a Ouija board today exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. And um, this must have been a very slow process of this device pointing to different letters and forming sentences, which is very remarkable when you read the notebooks, because although her messages are not very, very long, it still, you know, took quite a while to create them. And then someone else writes them down. And there you go. Then you have the messages from the spirit world. So they had a protocol, let's say, in the sense that Mm. they start with a prayer, there's a specific Mm. ritual in Mm. how they meet. Do they go on for hours and hours, or are these more short sessions? It's impossible to know, but considering Matilda Nilsson's work with the psychograph, at least it must have been, you know, a few hours devoted to this, because not only would Sigrid Hedman talk, which of course is quicker, but someone needed to write things down, and then Matilda Nilsson proceeded with the device, and then the group also often created uh, one or several automatic drawings. Right, and please explain an automatic drawing, what that is. So this is the practice when you experience that a spirit is controlling your hand while drawing, and communicate through uh, images, basically. And these were produced by Cornelia Sederberg, not by Auklin to begin with, but by Cornelia Sederberg. And um, their function was basically to explain or to illustrate the messages that had been received through Hedman and Matilda Nilsson. And do you have a sense of the mood? I mean, was this a very austere, serious group? Was there also room for laughter and jokes? What was the sort of the vibe, let's say? Since the material only described what they're doing and then the spirit messages, it's hard actually to say. But it seems like it was quite serious and that they were convinced that they were receiving something that was so special and and so sacred that I don't think there was much room for any jokes, actually. So the seriousness really comes down to the fact that it was something sacred to them. Mm. It was really important messages. So Absolutely. A certain calmness and, and dignification, I suppose, yeah, was, I think so. was in place. Now, the messages they receive, could you give a few examples? I mean, of course, they meet for many years, so there's a variety, but uh, just a few examples. So the messages, because they were a, a Christian group, the messages are often centered around Christian themes which is then mixed with occult elements, but it's it's a lot about love, it's a lot about humility, uh, it's a lot about um, different Christian uh, ideas, basically, on how you should live your life rightfully as a Christian person. But the purpose of this, 
according to the spirits, was that this would develop the women's souls and consciousness and prepare them for some sort of big task. And did they translate entire messages on each session or were there sessions where there was just nothing coming through? You no, know, it was always messages. <laughs> and, you know, from today's perspective, not perhaps believing in spirits in the same way, it's very clear that what they had read in the New Testament before beginning then reflects in, in what the spirit speaks and It's clear that this is very much a narrative that is produced by Sigurd Hedman and Matilda Nilsson. So it was a constant delivery from yes, the spiritual world. Yes, and it's, it's very coherent and it's, you know, and it's also very repetitive. Is it clear to them from the beginning who they are communicating with, if it's one or several spirits? That is clear, but the thing is that um, the five believe that they were in contact with a uh, high spiritual brotherhood, but not directly. They were in communication through intermediary beings, so other spirits. So they are in contact with the spirit called Gregor, one called Yeor, one called Amaliel, one called Ananda, and they're all communicating these messages from this higher spiritual brotherhood. So these intermediary beings are present from the beginning. However, they reveal little by little who this brotherhood is. So in this sense, they get slowly you know, to, to understand their purpose of being in contact with these spirits. So there are more layers to this. Not only is there spirits that they communicate mm. to, there are other deeper spirits. Exactly. And these are the spirits that oversee the whole universe and, and its evolution. And they have chosen the five specifically to receive their higher mystical messages. So was there an agreement in this group then that they were unique, they were chosen, there were no other people on this planet almost uh, absolutely <laughs> in the same position? Yeah, and that's also why they, I think, could meet for so many years, for a decade, because they felt that they had this huge task to do. What was the main purpose? What did they actually want to achieve apart from staying in touch with uh, the spiritual world? So the five wanted to, of course, receive messages from the spirit world, but these messages told them that they needed to develop themselves in order to receive a big task from these spirits. So this was the purpose of the group. Was it, let's say, a mission? Was that how they saw it? Was Were, were they going to save the world, so to speak? Yeah, this is the sort of the, the interesting part What this was was so vague. It was never really specified. And it was more sort of an encouragement for the women to keep on meeting each other for these seances that something was soon going to be revealed. They just need to keep on receiving these messages and to follow the instructions and encouragement to, to work on themselves. And soon they would be presented with something big. And this was, you know, ongoing They were never presented with anything. It was just a promise of something soon uh, happening. Was it important to them the fact that they were exclusively women in this group? Not explicitly, but uh, I absolutely think so, at least subconsciously, that they could uh, feel safe being in charge of this divine communication that they perhaps would have felt a bit less secure if a man was also involved, who perhaps also have, would have wanted to be in charge of this. And this is also something that is very characteristic of the occult movements of the time, that women are suddenly giving uh, the opportunity to be leaders. So what is interesting in the five, that they also give each other the communion, which is something, according to the church, only a a male priest could do. So within this group, they can really break free from these uh, structures of society. But was there a symbolic value in the sense, I mean, the church was exclusively male and so on, the fact that these are women now going on this message. Mm. Was there a point to that, do you think, in that sense? Again, I think this is important to see in perspective of occultism and the freedom that was given to women within these movements. So I think occultism provided them a arena to actually be able to develop themselves fully and to imagine themselves being on this big mission. And this would not have been possible if the word for these specific ideas. How much did they see each other outside the group? That is unfortunately not possible to tell. 
but they did meet for seances several times each month. And one can imagine that they were also having discussions about the messages they had received from spirits. So what was going on with the group? There was probably a lot going on that's not recorded in these protocols from the seances. So I can imagine they had a very frequent communication with each other. How does it develop over the years? I mean, do they keep the same ritual all through or does it change over time? They keep the ritual more or less. I mean, sometimes they read from occult books. Sometimes they hold each other's hands in a ring before beginning. There are a few variations, but the the element of prayer and the element of reading something, usually something from the Bible or the New Testament, is intact for the entire time. And what about their roles? I mean, you mentioned Sigrid Hedman and the others and the different roles. Do they change anything? For a long time, no. So it's Sigrid Hedman and Matilda Nilsson who are delivering the messages. It's Cornelia Sederberg who is then creating a drawing. And Clint and Anna Kassel are observing. And perhaps they're also the ones writing down these messages. So this stays the same for a very long time. But then after, what can it be, four, five years, Clint starts to uh, create automatic drawings with Cornelia Sederberg, and Anna Kassel starts to practice becoming a medium. Now, Hedvig, sometimes it's a bit confusing here because they do certain things as the group, them five. Sometimes they do things outside the group. Sometimes it's a bit in between. How can we sort of uh, navigate here in all these doings and and what part of of their practice it's about? Mm. Yeah, so... A common misunderstanding, as I've mentioned, is that the five would be involved in the mission. And this is not true because the five as a group and the seances that they had had no connection to the paintings. However, once the five had split, some of its members were actually assisting of Clint with paintings for the temple. So this is important to know, this sort of... uh, the different roles of these women and how they could be part of of Clint's work, although not as the five. And one important person was Cornelia Sederberg, actually, who have Clint had created drawings with within the five and who later would help her with several paintings, although not as a member of the five. Did they know always when they did something in the capacity of the five or a group or more as a free-flowing thing? Yes, because the five... Their practice was very set. So we have the protocols of their seances. Everything is recorded and we know exactly what was going on. And whatever happened outside of these seances was not as the five anymore in that sense. Uh, It's just like uh, Clint and Anna Kassel received the mission while they were members of the five, but they did not receive it within the group of the five. They were alone, right? So these levels are important to keep in mind. And it was very important then to know what you were doing and in which capacity, let's mm, say. Exactly. Mm. Eventually, there is a collapse of the group. Mm. Um, what are the situations leading up to that? So at that point, of Clint and Anna Kassel had received the mission to create paintings. And it seems that of Clint's confidence had grown after that point. And for some reason, she now wants to be the medium of the group as well and to deliver messages from the spirits and she's allowed to so what happens is that the spirits soon reveal to the group through Hilma Klint that Hilma Klint actually is their true leader and that all the other women should follow her and this becomes the last message that the group receives because this well it seems that it wasn't (laughs) received very well and that the other women actually got quite upset with it so then they actually stop meeting who received that message Clint communicates it to the entire group that she actually is the new leader. But of course, she phrases it as if it's the spirits who reveal to them that this is the case. Is it a total breakup or do they stay in touch? They do stay in touch uh, in some way. And Clint managed to gather the group one last time in Christmas 1907 when she wants to explain her paintings And uh, the other group is not very keen to hear this, and there is some sort of misunderstandings about this. And then it seems that they split for good. So they never talked again, basically? Well, they did. uh, Clint did have uh, some sort of communication with both Cornelia Sederberg and Sigrid Hedman, because 
they did assist her with some paintings later on. However, for example, with Matilda Nilsson, it seems to have been a complete cutoff. So I think the group reacted differently. I think our client maybe could explain her point of view more or less successfully to some people. But they never got together as the five again. It's amazing to think this dedication they all had, mm. the fact that they met regularly and for so many years and then a total breakdown. Mm. But perhaps this is also not uncommon. I mean, when you believe in something so mm. much, of course, the separation must be very painful. Yeah. And it also shows how um, how this deeply affected each member, because for of Clint, this idea of being chosen by higher spirits was fundamental for her to develop the idea of a mission, while for the other women it meant something else. So they all had this idea of what they were doing that soon started to uh, become different from each other and they started to separate. As we talk about in another episode, Anna Kassel and Hilma Klint, they continue their journey, to say the least. I mm. mean, they have a very important role working together. But after the breakdown, what other groups or movements do Hilma Klint engage in? Uh, well, of Klint becomes a theosophist. So she joins the Theosophical Society in 1904. She would later become an anthroposophist. Well, that's basically it. So instead of having these smaller groups, she mm. actually joins larger associations, mm. larger groups. And then she also, of course, collects other friends around her, so to say. She gathers new women around her, creating perhaps what would uh, become a new version of the five, but where she was the leader. And the fact that you leave smaller groups behind you, is that something also that happens in time? I mean, is it more common closer to the year 1900 than it is perhaps in the 20s or 30s? Mm. Is, that, is that a general tendency? Well, I think that how, how people went about socially was very different from how it is today because there was no other way to stay in touch than to meet each other and to write letters perhaps. But I think we have to keep in mind that this was a very different time Uh, where people perhaps lived in the present moment a lot more than we do today. Mm. Now, there's an entire flora and fauna of myths about Hilma of Klint and also the five. Can you mention just a few of them and why do you think they have been so popular? Mm. So, regarding the five, the common myth would be that of Klint was the leader of the five, that the other women assisted her with the paintings, that the five were involved in the mission to paint, that she received this within the group and perhaps that it was even directed to all the members of the five. And I think this is, it's it's been important because it has explained something, because there's been lack of research regarding exactly what was happening at this point. And I think the five has provided a very natural explanation. Uh, she met this group and of course they must have been, you know, involved. And also because of Clint has been this sort of lonely genius, it has been natural to assume that the other women assisted her and that she was the leader of the five. And also because there's been a myth that our client was introduced to spiritualism as a teenager, it would also be natural to assume that she was very advanced, while in reality she was quite new to spiritualism and was certainly not the active one in the five. So as so often, assumptions has been turned into facts, Yeah. but now the wheel has turned again. What kind of documentation has the group left behind, the five? They left behind over 2,000 pages of notebooks, which uh, sort of portrays their seances, their protocols, one can say, over their seances, which describe very well exactly what was going on. However, only during the seance, so we don't know what the women talked about before or after. They're only there to record what was going on and the messages they received from the spirits. How are they to read and go through these notes? I imagine they are quite difficult to interpret. It is quite hard because the messages they received from the spirits are extremely long-winded. A lot of words, but they say very little. A lot of repetitions, so there's a lot of text to go through, but there's very little information to actually extract. However, it's interesting to see that the group was very, very careful with these notes. So they have all been transcribed by Matilda Nilsson. So there were once original notes taken during the seance, and then she transcribed this into the notebook. So it's all, all very neat and well-written, 
And they really spent a lot of time producing this material. So documentation was important in general for this work? Extremely important. And this is also something you can see with other groups, like the Edelweiss Society, who also left huge material after after themselves and, and from their seances. And it seems to be simply from the idea that the spirits were revealing something important, and it was important to record it and to keep these records. Who kept the documentation once the group dissolved? Hilma Klint did for the five. And she seems to have had an interest in collecting notebooks because she has notebooks from the five, from her friend Anna Kassel, from Gusten, her friend Gusten Andersson, from Sigrid Hedman, and so on and so forth. So she was very fond of notebooks. <laughs> also kept a lot of notes herself. She kept a lot of documentation, yeah. thankfully. Yeah. Was it evident that it was Hilma Klint that was supposed to save all the documentation when they break up? That is not clear at all. Uh, and I don't know really how that went about because one could assume that, for example, Matilda Nilsson, who, who transcribed all, all the notes, would be the one who kept them, especially since the split wasn't, you know, as harmonious as one would have liked. But for some reason, Clint was the one who eventually took care of the material. Mm. Now, was there a rule within the five that they kept everything strictly to themselves or did they sometimes invite other people in or share anything with the outside world? For um, less than a year, they did have seances together with other spiritualists. For example, Oscar Busch, who was an important figure in Stockholm at that point, under the name of the Friday Group. So the Friday Group is not the five, which is sometimes... Uh, misunderstood, but it's just this um, constellation of the five and a few other people. And they met for less than a year. So there were a little bit of openings. Why did they stop? I don't know. It's unclear. And they didn't even meet on Fridays. (laughs) They met on Thursdays often. (laughs) So it's very, uh, yeah, The, the Friday group is a bit of a mystery. So despite documentation, there are still many unresolved questions. Absolutely. How is it to spend time with this material? I mean, obviously, this is a very specific belief system. Mm. Um, And sometimes maybe it's very foreign to things we Mm. believe today and so on. But as an historian, Mm. when you sit with all these Mm. documents and and automatic drawings, Mm. all these relics, really, Mm. from deep beliefs, deep held Mm. uh, truths, is it hard to make the distinction between fiction and reality and belief and actual events here? Mm. What is the case with this material is that it only describes the beliefs. And this is important to remember that it's not diaries in that sense that it describes something that happens in the material world. It only describes uh, the group's belief. But what I was struck by was, and which I know but at this time really could experience, was how important Christianity was in Sweden and for people generally at this time. Because really it's the Christian motifs that are central, although they are tweaked through an occult lens. This is still the main fundament of their group and their messages. And perhaps that's another important misunderstanding later on, the fact that these occult movements, they were actually very close to Mm. Christianity, or or at least the basic concept of Christianity. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it wasn't the case that these occult movements came in and then erased earlier beliefs, Christian beliefs, but they rather emerged together and and a new form of Christianity, one could say, was created because often what occultism could contribute was that uh, Christianity had not been interpreted in the right way. There was a, a true doctrine to be discovered. And, you know, Jesus had, you know, true messages that had been obscured by the church, etc. So although people were perhaps hesitant towards the church, still Christianity in itself lived very strong and well. Mm. Now, from this group, the five, we have the documentation and we have also, of course, the fame of Hilma Klint, which helps them further on. But can you imagine, are there many other groups of this kind that we just don't know about because they haven't left any traces? Probably, yes. Keeping in mind that this was a a big thing in Sweden, spiritualism, and that it was very popular among the upper class, I do think that there were many fractions and small groups that did meet for longer or shorter periods of time 
and perhaps that did save material, but that was later destroyed by relatives or, or in some sense. So absolutely, I think we have lost a lot of material from this unique uh, time. So although this is, of course, a fascinating case, it's important to remember that they actually reflect a much greater context of this uh, spiritual movements and occult interests. Absolutely. It's very typical, one can say, for what was going on at the time. What are the chances, do you think, I mean, this is hard to speculate, but in the future that we find more material, more research that can shed light over how many people participated in this? Mm. There are, of course, material in newspaper, etc., that can give us clues. But otherwise, we are are left to the goodwill of relatives who might have saved material from their old aunts or, or grandmothers or whatever. So people should just go up to their attic and, <laughs> and take a look and see if they can find something. Look through your drawers and boxes <laughs> and inherited stuff. There might be some gems exactly. hiding there. We hope we'll find more. Thank you so much for joining us, Hedvig. Thank you. Tack för att du har lyssnat på Stolpe Stories. Missa inte att du som lyssnar har 20% rabatt på bokförlaget Stolpes titlar hos bokus.com. Aktivera rabatten genom att ange koden STOLPE20. Och för att lyssna på fler avsnitt, följ oss där poddar finns och på sociala medier.